the email metrics you should measure and how to turn them into action webinar. Uh, we're really excited today to, uh, you know, not only have Litmus folks, but one of our friends from Ansira uh, on the line to talk about email metrics, email analytics, uh, and more importantly, how to make sense of some of those metrics that we most of the time it routinely see related to campaigns, um, the things that you're probably familiar with, but might not know how to actually put into action. Uh, so we have a lot of information for you today, a lot of tips to take some of those analytics and actually have them influence your campaigns and kind of improve your email program overall. Um, so I'm Jason Rodriguez. I'm the community and product evangelist at Limus. Uh, I've been in the email game for quite a while now. Uh, I like to say that I've lost most of my hair dealing with Outlook and Gmail problems. Um, but I'm joined today by with uh, Karina Sanchez Gudino from Litmus and then Richard Flores from Mansira. Um, so say hi, guys. Hello, this is Karina. I am part of the account management team here at Litmus. So I'm one of the uh, privileged ones that gets to interact with a lot of the different clients here at Litmus. Excited to be here. Hello, I'm Richard Flores, Vice President of Channel Integration and Delivery at Ansira. You know, super happy to be here. Thanks again for the invite. You know, Ansira is an independent marketing technology and services firm. You know, we're close to about 900 employees now orchestrating customer engagement, channel empowerment, and local activation. You know, with long-term relationships supporting over 150 clients, more than 15 verticals, we focus on delivering outstanding customer experiences for both relationship and channel marketing. So thanks again for having and love you know having the conversation on email analytics. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Uh, I guess we'll get started with uh, just kind of talking about email analytics in general. So I'm going to kick it over to you to Karina to uh, start off this discussion. Uh, awesome. So we, we kind of think of sometimes email analytics as the black box of email analytics. And this is a, a literal black box of um, a lot of information goes in here, but we don't really know what happens. And we're not really sure if it's actually coming out anywhere. So anecdotally, we hear that many email teams gather most of their email intelligence from their email service provider. Um, this is sort of the, the most reliable or sort of the primary source of information as it pertains to how are um, you know, our, our emails getting anywhere, are they being opened? But in the recent study uh, or one of our most recent surveys, we found that 63% of respondents stated that they use a third-party service to collect additional email data in an effort to supplement what they receive from their email service provider. The question that follows this is, are you actually pulling or, or putting all of this data to use? Are you seeing it from a holistic approach or does it live in silo? Just because we're leveraging third-party vendors to collect data, it doesn't actually mean that we're merging this data into a centralized system so that we can review it as a whole versus individual sets of data points. Brick and mortar have spent countless resources optimizing the in-store experience for customers. As digital marketers, we optimize our websites, leveraging web analytics to understand where our visitors are coming in from, what they're doing, how they're navigating, and we optimize based on the time spent on page and actions taken. So why are we not paying the same attention to email? We may know how people, or we may know how many people open and click, and we might track them once they get to the site, but why don't we gather more data as to how our subscribers are interacting with our messages so that we can optimize the experience we provide them? Yeah, like you mentioned, Karina, there's a lot of people using those third-party tools, and I, I suspect that one of the biggest hurdles is taking all of these disparate tools, all these different data sources, and kind of putting them together and making sense of them. Um, so in our research, we've seen that a lot of folks are using kind of web, traditional web tools for uh, tracking their email campaigns, the big one being Google Analytics. Uh, so 69.8% of respondents from our survey showed that they were using Google Analytics, uh, which is nice because it's free. Uh, it works well, it's really thorough. Um, so a lot of people seeing uh, or using that in those email campaigns. Uh, we're really happy to see Litmus Email Analytics, the second most popular choice there, followed by Adobe Analytics uh, and a couple of other choices. Um, but it's all these third-party tools that you're using and all these different data sources that they're trying to make sense of that really causes a lot of trouble, uh, a lot of challenges to make sense of that analytics data. When it comes to the things that people are actually tracking, uh, we've noticed that 
there's there tends to be the traditional things that are are the most focused on um but perhaps not the most uh, in depth or useful when it comes to showing ROI or lifetime subscriber value uh, but the major ones that people are looking at are things like opens clicks and bounces um before getting into things like conversions deliverability spam complaints all that kind of stuff uh, but these are the kind of things that a lot of ESPs bubble up um so those are the ones they tend to pay attention to are those opens clicks and bounces uh, the things they want to invest in, though, kind of flips that chart almost completely. Uh, so the things, uh, the, the metrics that marketers really want to start digging into over the course of the next year or two is trying to figure out how they can attribute subscriber lifetime value and revenue per subscriber to their email campaigns. Uh, so it's all about getting that insight into your return on investment to prove that your email marketing is doing what it needs to do. Um, and that's definitely a, a tricky thing to do, especially as email becomes uh, more integrated with this omni-channel marketing experience. And we have all these different touch points, uh, all these different places that subscribers and customers are connecting with our brand. Uh, wedging email marketing into that omni-channel presence is a little bit trickier. Um, and that's why we see less people focusing or being able to track some of those things like uh, subscriber lifetime value and return on investment, but that really being what they want to start focusing on moving forward. Um, so it's interesting to look at data points like this and just understand where people are and where they want to get. Um, so understanding those email analytics and just the baseline analytics is probably a good place to start and what we're going to talk about next. So talking about traditional um, analytics or traditional email metrics, as we talk about email metrics, it's very important to ensure that all parties involved have a clear definition of how these metrics are actually gathered. Oftentimes when talking with others about email analytics, I find that we're using the same acronyms or terms, but we actually define them slightly different or uh, uh, calculate them slightly different. So as we move or, or look at defining um, what these metrics are, how we calculate them, um, this is the more traditional definition. In all cases, um, unique opens and unique clicks are used instead of totals to accurately reflect individual subscribers. However, um, it is really important to understand your exact business because this may vary depending on your business especially if you rely on visits or impressions as in that particular case you might actually want to rely a total or, or utilize total clicks um, because that is the metric that actually matters the most as you're driving uh, folks to your website it is also important to look at your business and your business goals Many times we want to look at industry standards and how everybody else is doing things, but every business is different. If you rely on reports or dashboards provided by your email sending platform or slash ESP, you should also place close attention as to how they calculate these rates. As surprising as it may be, you will actually find that different systems calculate these metrics differently. Now, as we look at them a little bit more uh, closely, why should we care about these different email metrics? The open rate should be a key measure for copywriters and those in charge of subject lines and preview text. Anyone involved in segmentation and targeting should also be paying a close, close attention to open rate. The click-through rate takes into account all of the inbox action. By contrast, this click-through rate includes actions of those uh, that have received the message, that have opened the message, uh, that may uh, have a particular bias for the brand, but the click through open rate actually measures the effectiveness of your creative and design by showing how many people actually converted. It really does, uh, should be a sort of a, a driver or a key metric that design teams and web development teams should look at as they look to optimize um, and, and drive higher clicks from particular opens. Richard, can you tell us a little bit more as to why is it that Ansira decides to look at some of this data outside of their ESPs or a particular system? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's important to note that while looking at campaign data, individually or on an individual campaign basis is important. Graphing that out as to evaluate trends or the overall health of your email program is extremely impactful. And so what we've got kind of displayed here is an example of our email operational dashboard grouping campaigns by category and type. So this is a linear view of a specific campaign type over time. And as you can see, it's got a fairly consistent pattern 
in our sending frequencies where we've got weekly communications with a follow-up um, sent to non-openers. And there's an area that just jumps out um, that you know requires further research. And so whether it's you know the content itself, maybe a different shading of subject line, the audience may have been different. Or, or even an operational issue that needs to be addressed, you know, graphically showing this outside of just traditional individual sends allows the email operational team, you know, a view into their email health to kind of gauge, you know, their subscriber behavior and, and effectiveness. That's awesome. Uh, so definitely a lot to, you know, look at when you're looking at opens, click through rates, click to open rates. Um, but what are some other metrics that we can look at when we're trying to gauge the health and determine strategy based on analytics for email campaigns? Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite categories is uh, the idea of email clients, reading environment engagement. Um, so this gives you a really good insight into where and how people are engaging with your email campaigns. Uh, so as always, let's start with a couple of definitions. Uh, an email client is the actual program, the piece of software that subscribers use to open your email campaign. Uh, so this can be anything from Apple Mail to Gmail to Outlook, uh, Thunderbird, some of those classic clients. Whereas the reading environment is the platform where the email is opened. Uh, so in Litmus Email Analytics, we actually buck this into three separate sections. Uh, the reading environment is either on the desktop, which is any application that's installed on desktop or laptop computers. Um, so these are the more traditional kind of sometimes businessy types of applications you might think of like Outlook, Thunderbird, and Apple Mail. Uh, Webmail is any browser-based email client, so things like Yahoo Mail, Gmail, or Outlook.com. Uh, and then mobile is, you know, as it says, mobile apps that are installed on devices like phones and tablets. Um, so the, the, these are the ones that people are using on the go, uh, and they're using things like Apple Mail and iOS, Samsung Mail, the Gmail app, and a couple of other kind of third-party clients as well. Um, but these are really great to get an idea of where people are opening, what devices they're using, and then tailoring your strategy based on that information. Uh, one of the biggest ways to do that is by looking at things like your from name, your subject line, and then your preview text inside of your email campaigns. Since those different devices and platforms display that inbox information differently, uh, you know we have character accounts to worry about, how much preview text is shown, uh, whether or not that subject line is going to get cut off. Uh, understanding where your subscribers are opening will allow you to tailor all that information better to those subscribers. Um, this is really helpful to, vo to avoid those, you know, unfortunate subject line cutoffs and uh, that preview text that really isn't working and get that open. Uh, we've actually seen at Limits that we have kind of a strange flipped audience uh, based on, you know, overall email open trends. Um, so the global averages are shown on the left here. Uh, you can see that mobile and webmail are massive when it comes to email opens, whereas desktop is just a small slice of that pie. Our own litmus audience is kind of flipped there. Uh, we have a huge desktop audience and a huge webmail audience, but a relatively small mobile audience. Um, so this is interesting because it allows us to, you know, focus our development efforts on those clients that we need to cover. Um, but it's it's kind of you know indicative of us being in the B two B space, a B two B product. Um, so this is an outside of the realm of possibilities for other companies. Uh, but since we're Litmus, since we're the email folks, we still have to make sure all of our emails work really well on mobile devices because uh, we do have that subscriber base that will call us out on any email problem we send, uh, which is good and bad. Um, it's a nice place to be in, but <laughs> definitely causes some uh, stress for our email team. A good example of how we use this client device and platform data was a recent email campaign and a lot of our more recent email campaigns that our email developers have been updating and adding certain interactive elements and hover effects to enhance that subscriber experience. Um, so this was an email we sent out. You can see in the GIF there that it has this nice hover effect when you hover over that download the guide CTA. Um, so this is a great thing. It gives people a, veer, a very clear visual indicator that you want them to take some action. Uh, however, that hover state isn't supported everywhere. So we wanted to find out whether or not it's worth the additional effort for us to add that kind of code, add that development time and that testing time to our email campaigns. So when we looked at our email analytics, we actually found out that 67% of all Litmus subscribers were in fact opening in email clients and on platforms that supported that hover effect. 
Um, so that in that case, it, it's pretty clear that it's worth us, worth the time and the effort to add those interactive elements and that specifically that hover element uh, for all of our emails because a lot of our subscribers were in fact opening any email clients that allowed them to take advantage of that added uh, subscriber experience. Uh, Richard, I know you guys use this kind of data for a little bit different purposes outside of interactivity and hover effects. Uh, mind walking us through how Ansira uses this kind of data? Yeah, absolutely. In, in, in a multi-client environment, such as an, an agency, we have to use data to, to make cognizant decisions of where to spend our resources. And, you know, when evaluating a new design or simply running campaigns through the production team, it's important to have a sound understanding of what your target audience is and the, and the makeup of the devices that they interact with. Um, so we use a combination of litmus checklist and analytics to get a better sense of, you know, what did our audience look like historically? and then curtail our testing using checklists around those device distributions. You know, you mentioned earlier kind of B2B type communications. You know, we more focus our rendering concerns on Microsoft products or webmail as opposed to B2C type communications that have a broader array of mobile devices and email clients. You know, it, it's well known that ISPs are changing frequently and what they render and the elements that they display change over time. And so using the data from Litmus and the tools, i.e., you know, such as Builder, to quickly you know, test different iterations or code to see if things degrade gracefully in different clients to make sure that the vast majority of, of subscribers that represent the largest distribution of devices have the experience that we, we want them to have. And if there are rendering issues, that those only impact potential devices that represent you know, less than 1% of, of audience or, or things of that nature. Yeah, I, I like seeing where people open. Um... But then it's also important to see, you know, how they're engaging with that email campaign and how long they're actually reading your email campaign. Uh, so knowing the devices they're using, the platforms, one side of it, but then using this engagement data is the other half of this. Um, so engagement, as we define it, is how long subscribers look at your email campaign. Uh, some other products call it email read time. You might see that in blog posts. Uh, but at Litmus, using email analytics, we bucket into three sections again. Uh, so read is anything that's open for eight or more seconds. Uh, subscribers that skimmed an email campaign means that they looked at it for more than two seconds, but less than eight seconds. And then people that just glanced at it, opened it up, uh, you know, decide it wasn't for them, and they close it less than two seconds in. Um, so we do have those three buckets to gauge that subscriber engagement and how long they're actually looking at your email read times. Uh, but again, Richard, you guys have a great example of how this kind of data informed your design decisions and your testing efforts in recent campaigns. Yeah, so we had a new design project that we were you know, kind of working through and, and with an effort to put the audience first, right? We're, we're here to build customer experiences. And part of that is creating an environment that customers can interact with your emails effectively. So we had a, a multi-column image heavy design and we're pursuing a single column for mobile first design with this customer. And we looked at historic email analytic data to understand and set a threshold or a benchmark of where our status quo was. You know, assuming opens would potentially be you know, fairly similar across a different design, we wanted to leverage read rate to really identify or capture success in this redesign. And so in this new kind of single column mobile first design, we saw an increase uh, read rate of, a, of across about 15 or 10 to 15 percent and conversely saw the skim time and glance time reduced as well. And while this is a good example of leveraging this data for like a full redesign, I think there's opportunities to, to leverage this kind of approach in, in just testing cycles in various capacities, whether you're looking at you know, the length of copy or modular placement or image size, I think you can leverage historic analytic data, specifically read time, to understand the directional impact that that may have on a potential redesign or a, a change in your email communications. So talking about geolocation, this is another very important metric that is key in order for us to understand where our opens are taking place and give us insight as to how we can better target our emails by modifying language, time of day send, uh, probably based on time zone and content. So this ties into some of the examples that uh, Richard was providing because as marketers, we need to be able to look at, at every single data point that may be provided to us explicitly or implicitly. 
So as we look a little bit more in terms of exactly what geolocation means, again, coming back to basics with the definition, it specifically looks at where your subscriber was when they physically opened the email, including the country, region, and city. Um, many times we're able to gather this information because a customer has either provided their zip code or an address. But there's also the case where we choose as marketers to not gather this information because we want to lower the barrier of the email sign up. So we only ask for the email address. In this case, which is uh, a little bit of the practice that Litmus follows, we rely heavily on geolocation uh, and we see it as a critical way to segment in order for us to be able to understand how we need to target our audience in order to be able to reach them. And actually, Jason has a really uh, great example that's going to show us a little bit more of based on how we understand where our audience is and where they're opening their messages, how we put that into action. Yeah, so at Limus, we have a pretty gen like widely distributed audience. Uh, it's definitely heavy in North America, but we have folks subscribing our emails from all around the world, uh, which is important to understand, especially when we start promoting our conferences, Litmus Live. Um, so side note, those are coming up soon. Go to litmus.com slash conference and check those out. Uh, but we wanted to be able to promote it for specific locations. Um, so in this example, we wanted to promote ticket sales for Litmus Live London. Uh, so we knew that we had customers uh, you know, in the UK, in mainland Europe, and those are the ones that really want to hear about Litmus Live London because that's the closest location. Um, but unfortunately, we had a lot of that missing location data for our subscribers in our CRM. Uh, so we were able to look at our limiting email analytics uh, from past sends and understand where people are opening. And we were able to take that data and sync it up to our ESP and start segmenting so that we could target subscribers that recently opened in the UK and mainland Europe. And that allowed us to speak specifically to them about the conference they're most likely interested in um, and kind of cut out all the noise of the other conferences or other information that they might not necessarily care about. Um, so this was a great way to add that missing location data, add that additional information, and use email analytics to really uh, you know, drive the strategy behind some of our recent email promotions. Yeah, and, and as Karina mentioned, you know, data collection varies across different customers. And we have a customer that collects location as part of the sign-up process, but in, you know, in a several amounts of, of customers, that data becomes stale over time and isn't necessarily updated with the frequency or cadence that's, cadence that's needed. And so leveraging the geolocation data from email analytics, we wanted to validate and do a comparison to first party reported information and comparing to where people are actually engaging with our communications. And what we we're able to find was about 40% of those that engage with the communication, at least in this use case, we did not have an, an active location for, they were currently unknown. 22% of those that engaged validated that the location that we had on file was accurate. And 8% of the audience that engaged um, showed an in, uh, interaction with email and a location that differed for that of the database. And while you know, the, the data itself we collected over time to build confidence in modifying kind of profiles, the, the data itself can, is powerful to be able to extend customer profiles or attributes, you know, leverage for you know, deeper segmentation as, as Litmus is doing but also like empower the local activation. You know, at Ansira, we, we you know, manage marketing communications as a, at a, as a whole, but also to empower the local markets. And having a better, a better understanding of where people are interacting with their emails will allow you to build customer experiences that are more powerful in that local market. So to bring it back together, what can we do with geolocation? The few ideas that we implement and that we wanted to share with you guys is set specific, um, see if specific content or products resonate in different countries. We have to be very, very careful of how certain language, promotions, the sell aspect of it uh, resonates from uh, one continent to the other, but even within uh, a specific continent, how it varies. You also want to use geolocation to segment your audience by time zone. We ourselves actually leverage this, and it's a, it's a key component when we launch ticket sales for Litmus Live because we do have a limited number of tickets available, and we have to make sure that uh, we can target all time zones to give every possible attendee an equal opportunity to actually purchase a ticket and not miss out um, on them. Also, leverage uh, 
the geolocation to understand if there's any local holidays that will impact your campaign. Um, in the US, we have specific holidays that we use to drive a lot of ourselves, um, maybe a lot of our reminders, but we also need to understand how that varies country to country. And then also determine if localizing content is worth the added cost and effort. Depending again on your business, on your goals, you might have to invest into localization of content through language adaptation, uh, specific symbol usage, um, as well as imagery. So now the big question, integrating email analytics data. Email teams rely rely on or have a number of different third parties that they're getting specific data points example your crm your email service provider or even litmus but you're only looking at data in silos versus actually putting it all together which means you're not getting the full picture of what a subscriber or customer is doing we are getting all of this little small snippets of information but we're never really able to fit them all together in order to actually make them actionable so why should you integrate your uh, different silo data into a single location, most of the time being the CRM? I have been hearing about big data since 2009 or earlier. It's a term that as marketers we have used at least a couple of times, but in order to have access or use big data, we must collect the data, merge it, and act on it. This is why mapping out the flow of information is key understand how data is to be funneled from one system to the other in order to make actual use of it. This is also critical uh, as you're trying to justify the resources needed to make the integration happen. And on this one, I'm actually gonna share a quick anecdote. I used to work at an email service provider and I was working on this huge strategy uh, assessment for a customer where we we're going to put together a state of the union on their current email program. So I needed to pull information about this customer's performance um, going back years. And as such, I needed to make a request to my dev team to give me this information. So the challenge was that even though we're both in the email service industry, even though we have information stored on it, the way in which I was making the request was actually creating confusion for the developer that needed to give me this information. We were going back and forth, as many of you guys have done, over a JIRA ticket, and after probably two hours of that back and forth, I decided to walk 40 feet over to his desk and ask, this is what I'm asking for, and this is why I need it. It wasn't until I actually said, this is why I need the information funnel this way that he was able to understand and tell me this is what I can give you, which actually leads to the next question. What's the benefit? What are the resources needed? It's important for us to ask the right questions and be ourselves able to answer these questions in return, especially if we're trying to uh, get additional resources or buy-in from stakeholders or other team members. Integrations are consuming both on time, resources, and sometimes uh, budget. But with that, it's important to understand, can we find a middle ground? Obviously, we would all prefer automation. We would all prefer for the systems to just talk to each other. API tends to be the most common way. But if that's not available, or if it's something that's tailored out or tabled for a later point in time, are there other options? Is perhaps SFTP import? Is that something that can work? So. Within Litmus, we are able to give you detailed information on where your subscribers are opening their message from device to email clients to location and duration of the open. And the data is actually provided in a very pretty report that comes in very handy when graphs are not your forte, but we also encourage our customers to download the reports in order to look at it alongside with other information that they're collecting. We offer the ability for our users with the right permissions to download the file with the results directly from the application. This is a great way to get access to your data, but it can be very manual and time consuming, especially for folks in the agency space or those that are running many campaigns at once. To make it easy to retrieve the data from Litmus and to integrate it with CRMs, we also offer an automated export, which will drop a file into a secure um, FTP folder FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol, where this can be taken from its uh, to its final destination. Getting the data out of Litmus and into the SFTP requires zero effort on the client side, and this is all done on our end. But it gives 
all the information from Litmus into an area that you can now um, either import it, manually go retrieve it, or again, if you have API, you can just pick it up and upload it there. Um, this is also when asking the right questions from your vendors is key. What kind of features or setup do your vendors offer that can take some of the work off your shoulders and make it easy for you to get the data that you need? So I know we, we scanned through it, but if you don't mind, Jason, going back to the sample report, this is definitely where the gold pot lies. And I know, Richard, this is the area that you guys look at more directly versus the dashboards with an application, correct? That is correct. And, you know, we, we've leveraged a couple installations where we're, we're using the interface to export the data in a more of an ad hoc fashion. And we have some customers that are using the full kind of integration via the SFTP drop. But I think it's important to note that, you know, while in this example, we've got email address as our key identifier for the customer, there's options to, you know, not have to expose email address to a third party, in this case, Litmus. And so understanding and working with your internal security compliance teams to understand, you know, do we need to involve hashing or encryption or leveraging another customer identifier to pass into Litmus so that way there's no additional PII that's being sourced or sent to, to third party vendors. So I think uh, Litmus has done a great job providing an, an open architecture, if you will, to generate this information and then consume it in either an ad hoc fashion via the interface um, that Jason showed or, or the, uh, a report or a file base similar to this report here on screen. That's awesome. Yeah, there's uh, definitely a couple of ways to get that data out of there uh, and, you know, start integrating it with your different systems, uh, which is really the name of the game. You know, you, you get access to this data, then you need to figure out how to make the best use of it and work with other teams to, you know, really put it to work to influence our email marketing programs. Um, but this brings up the question, how can we make the case for in more investment and getting more out of our email analytics data? Um, so we have a couple of tips for trying to get that investment, get that buy-in, and get that re those resources that you need to really put email analytics and all these metrics to work. Uh, the first of which is that you should really start making the most of the data and the tools that you already have. Um, so a lot of folks already have Google Analytics. They already have Litmus Email Analytics. They have other tools in place that they're currently using, but they might not be taking full advantage of those tools. So really taking the time to, you know, understand, learn more about those tools and try to figure out what that data is telling you about your campaigns, about your email programs, overall health uh, is really the best place to start before you start, uh, you know, trying to get more buy in for additional resources or data scientists or, uh, you know, third party agencies to come in and help you out there. Um, so really digging into the data you have digging into the tools that you already have access to and figuring out how they work and what they're telling you is a great first step for getting more out of your email analytics program. Another key point is to share the knowledge by giving your team access to email analytics insights. Again, as we're trying to get stakeholders or as we're trying to get others to care about email and the efforts we're trying to drive, it is key that we share the results, both the good and the bad. Too often, email designers and email developers never actually see any of the results of their efforts. But if you don't have access to the data, how are you supposed to know what works and what doesn't? Recently, I actually came across a Facebook post of um, somebody I get to work with, one of my clients, where she was mentioning that she does email design and she was actually tasked to prove how her performance uh, her, or her initiatives were actually performing. She had never done a report, she decided to start digging the numbers, and then she was actually able to show the team that her design initiatives were driving higher click-through rates. The level of empowerment that she felt at that point encouraged her to want to have a greater voice and greater stake in the game as it pertained to email. Again, if you're asking for resources from other teams outside of those involved in email, share your success so they know the impact that their input has or um, the kind of uh, success that it brought to the team. You've been you know, getting more out of your analytics tools. You've been sharing that around. Uh, so that brings up the topic of trying to convince your boss to invest more in your email program and in email analytics in particular. 
Um, so the best way to do that is by looking at what you've gathered, what you've been testing, all of the metrics that you've been collecting, and using that to make the case. Show your boss you know, how this tracking influences your strategy, your design, your de development process. Show them the value there uh, so that they can make that determination and understand that you're getting real benefits out of investing in email analytics. Uh, we've actually seen this at Litmus through our own research that brands that utilize Litmus email analytics uh, generate an ROI of 45 to 1, whereas brands that only rely on their ESP's analytics, uh, their ROI is a little bit lower at 39 to 1. Um, so still both amazing numbers to have in the marketing world, uh, but by investing in those additional Litmus email analytics resources, those reports that we generate, taking advantage of things like the FTP drop, these brands are really getting better insights into their email campaigns. Uh, you can always make the case too that it's a competitive advantage. Uh, we saw that 42% of brands say that growing their email analytics and their big data capabilities are a huge priority in 2019. Uh, so you can always say to your boss, you know, we don't want to be left behind. We have all of these competitors. Uh, they're breathing down our necks. They're investing in email analytics. They're investing in understanding their campaigns better. We don't want to be left behind. Uh, so you can join those brands in investing in your analytics capabilities and understanding all this data that's coming in and bringing it all together and really drive home that point that, you know, it's a huge competitive advantage uh, if you're willing to make those investments. And, and finally, ask for help. You know, whether you're having to reach out to an internal resource, partner with a peer to make the data actionable, or partner with an agency, you know, if you have a strategy and a use case for leveraging email analytic data, such as read rates, read categories, you know, don't hesitate. You know, if put a, a plan in place that allows you to, you know, take action on that data and start to see that kind of come to fruition in the results and the experiences that you're creating for your customers. Yep, we actually want to run a quick poll too. Um, we know there's a lot of you, a ton of you on this webinar, which is awesome to see. Uh, but we want to know whether or not you need help, you know, understanding those email analytics, understanding that data and putting it to work. Uh, so you should see a poll pop up right now um, asking you if you need help bringing your email analytics together and putting them to work. Uh, so we'd love to hear if you'd, you know, like to learn more about NSEER and how they can help you out. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about how Litmus can help you out with email analytics, or if you're not interested in any way, shape, or form, just click that no thanks button. Uh, so I'm gonna let this run for a minute. Um, I'm seeing the numbers rolling in, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so I'll give it a minute here to finish up and then we'll close out that poll. And we'll start opening up the Q&A questions from all of you. There are a lot of people still voting, this is awesome. <laughs> Cool. It looks like it's slowing down. Uh, so that's awesome. A lot of people want to hear from both NCR and Litmus about how to take better advantage of email analytics and understand that data. Uh, so we'll definitely follow up with all of you. Uh, thanks for entering there. Um, for those of you that already have your email analytics on point and uh, know what to do, then cool. That's awesome. Uh, feel free to share you know, your tips and tricks on Twitter using that Litmus Live hashtag. Uh, we'd love to hear how you're putting email analytics to work. So with that, we are gonna open it up to anybody that happens to have questions. Uh, again, you can ask those questions in the chat window in GoToWebinar. Um, and we're gonna invite Whitney, I believe, uh, who's on our content marketing team to help out with those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hey, everybody. I want, just wanna say, you know, y'all have been sending, sending in a lot of really great questions and uh, making my job Nice and busy, so thank you guys for that. I'm glad you guys are enjoying the webinar. Let's see. I think the first question we've got up here is, uh, you know, what do I do if I don't have a data team, but I want to start working on digging through all of this data? Karina, I know uh, we were chatting a little bit before the webinar started and you had some thoughts on the best way to do something like that. Yes, so one of the things that I like that I do want to mention is that what I find very amazing about the space is that whether you are a super large corporation or a smaller, more nimble team, some of these challenges are actually across the board. So you're not the only one that may not have the resources to actually dive into a very sophisticated uh, data mining system. Um, but the best way to get started is honestly to lose the fear of Excel. 
as much as we don't think about it, Excel is our best friend. Even if it's just manually, take one campaign at a time, take one set of messages at a time and start playing around with uh, mapping them into an Excel document and, and try to see how that starts to shape up from a trend standpoint. Um, I know um, one of our speakers last year during Litmus Live actually showed uh, or did a session specifically talking about um, what Excel can do for us at an, uh, a sort of at a, at a level to look at this kind of analytics. So we can definitely share that um, with you guys as well on our uh, uh, blog post follow up. But YouTube and Excel, I had to learn how to do macros because I wanted to to understand more of um, what the email metrics were for some of my clients. So I highly encourage you guys to do that as well. Yeah, I, I can actually. I was, going to, I was going to add to that and that it, it's also important to have kind of a, a goal in mind or at least a, a series of goals you know when, when you just start looking at raw data it, it's just a bunch of rows right really when you think about it and so if you're trying to find or, or build a, a case specific to you know read time in a specific campaign or an audience and potentially their behavior i think it's a lot easier to have a focal point of what you're trying to get and then make that you know kind of your narrow focus and whether that's in excel or in your ESP to Karina's point, I think that's those are viable tools to do that. But you know, just kind of analyzing it at, at face value sometimes becomes you know difficult to achieve you know some level of success. Yeah, I was going to add uh, to the point of learning Excel. Uh, there was a great book that helped me out a lot uh, called Data Smart by somebody named John Foreman, who was actually heavily involved in the email space. He was, uh, I believe, Mailchimp's first data scientist. And now I think he's like vice president of product or senior vice president of product over at MailChimp. Um, but tons of great tips in there. Uh, you know, there's a couple of great websites on Excel tips. Um, but just kind of digging in, playing around with the data you already have. Uh, it's all about getting to know that data and the tools that you already have at, at your fingertips. Um, but yeah, I, I really like that. We'll definitely share some resources on the blog post around getting comfortable with that kind of stuff. Awesome. All right. We've got quite a number of questions coming in about specific metrics, so I think we'll dive into one of those. Uh, Chris asked, you know, what when we say read time, what does read time mean, and how is it collected from an email? Yeah, so as far as Litmus email analytics goes, um, you know, we it, it works on similar principles as all email analytics tracking, uh, which is looking at, you know, we we add in that little pixel that is downloaded from a server. And when that happens, we can see, uh, you know, how long somebody has that email opened up, uh, when they opened it, where they opened it. That's how we get all that information. Um, but it's 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 kind of one of those metrics. It's, it's great to see that engagement time and get kind of higher level views, uh, you know, like Richard shared with that A-B test. And they use that engagement time to understand whether or not that new layout was working for them. Um, that being said, it, it doesn't make any assumptions as to what people are reading in the email or what their area of interest is. Uh, it doesn't really, you know, it's harder to get that kind of heat map overlay or um, anything like that in those kinds of metrics. Uh, that's where something like click click to open rate, click, uh, click through rate really comes into play where you can focus on. You can see, you know, with email engagement, how long somebody typically looks at an email, um, but not where they're focus or where their interest is and that's where those other metrics come in to support that kind of data uh richard do you have any other insights into uh, how that might be really useful or any other use cases no i, I think the the definitions you, you provided for the read read time make, makes total sense and i think from a content perspective you know leveraging that a b test scenario we talked through earlier you know if you're really trying to garner you know how people are interacting or reading your content there's definitely opportunities for multivariate tests to kind of put singular focus of content in version A and then a different piece of content for version B and then maybe your full set of email for version C. And so while you may be able to identify read time across the entire campaign, if there's only singular purpose content in versions A and B, you may be able to, to make some decisions on how that content actually itself interacted with the, with the subscriber as opposed to the communication as a whole. So awesome. you know, test and learn you know, different scenarios and kind of leverage. Now, now that kind of we've put some definition around what those metrics are, you know, being able to use them in a variety of use cases definitely becomes possible. Awesome. Let's see. Uh, Karina, I think this will be a good one for you. Uh, Jackie was wondering, 
Do you take unsubscribe rates into account when looking at email performance? And additionally, what benchmarks do you use yeah. for open rate and click-through rate? This is actually a great question. And we were debating on whether putting a slide that actually talked about unengagement rates and unsubscribe rates, but it's getting a lot of lengthy, but I would say it is actually a critical part to track. Um, as much as we want to understand how many customers are engaging with our content, we also need to understand how many folks are becoming tired of the content or are choosing to unsubscribe from it because it can be very, very telling of list exhaustion or whether in general the content that we're giving to them uh, resonates or not. So unsubscribe rates, uh, the more traditional way in which it is uh, captured, um, there's actually two components depending on how you're looking at it. Um, total unsubscribes uh, divided by uh, total delivered that tells you how many folks uh, out of your total list decided to remove themselves. But you can also look at uh, the unengagement rate, which would be the unsubscribes to, uh, divided by the number of opens, uh, which are telling you how many folks are opening and making a conscious decision to remove themselves. And again, um, something that sometimes tends to be forgotten is that we also need to look at spam complaints. So spam complaints can usually be provided by your sending platform, whether it's something internal or um, again, if you're leveraging an ESP. Um, but that's another very important metric because it's telling you that subscribers are telling you this is not content they want to receive, but for some reason they found it harder to remove themselves directly from you uh, versus going through the ESP unsubscribe method. One unsubscribe through the uh, unsubscribe link is always far favorable than a, a spam complaint. It's I think the threshold is 0.02%, so we're given very little room um, on, on the different email clients, Gmail, Outlook, they give us very little room uh, for having that unsubscribe report. But when customers click our unsubscribe link, it shows that we as senders are giving our subscribers the right way to opt out of our messages and that we're complying with the rules that are imposed on us for how we should be communicating with customers. So it is a very uh, key metric to cover um, and we can definitely be sure to include a little bit more on that um, on the blog post. Um, again, traditionally, most metrics are derived by um, total, uh, sorry, unique numbers. So open rate is unique opens divided by total delivered, click-through rate, unique clicks divided by unique op uh, unique total delivered, and then um, click-through rate is unique opens divided by unique, uh, sorry, unique clicks divided by unique opens. Um, but uh, you want to make sure that those that is consistent with how your systems are tracking it and how you specifically want to report on it um, based on your business goals. And Karina, you mentioned earlier on you know keeping data data being in silos and kind of breaking those those walls down, you know leveraging read time as an indicator of potential future unsubscribes or spam complaints may be a good indicator to use to kind of predict people who are fatiguing with your content or your communication stream. So while you've got all this disparate data sources you know with engagement data, putting that together to, to paint a picture of what the subscriber's overall health or kind of behavior is, Maybe a good, you know, predictive um, tool um, to kind of circumvent on subscribes. That's actually a great note. I mean, the the one of the things that, that's key about data is that we should use it to help us drive our strategy. So if we can prevent an unsubscribe by engaging with customers, so re-engaging them, um, that's definitely a huge win. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see, Michael and Nesh uh, both actually have sort of a question, uh, but also a pushback they receive pretty often around open rates. Um, you know, how accurate are open rates, rate metrics? Just wondering your guys' thoughts on that. Yeah, so this is this is interesting timing. Uh, so we're doing the webinar today. Uh, yesterday I recorded a podcast episode of the Delivering Podcast that Limits just started doing with Chad White from Oracle. And this was one of the main topics of conversation. Um, so that will be published on the Limits blog tomorrow. Um, so if you want like a more in-depth discussion around open rates and the metrics that really matter, that's a really good place to go. Um, 
I, I would say open rates are pretty accurate in that you know it triggers that tracking pixel. Uh, it tells us somebody's downloaded that and it shows that that email is in fact opened. Um, and while it can be a good indicator of whether or not your inbox strategy, that kind of like front of the envelope type stuff, uh, like your from name, your subject line, your preview text is working, uh, it's not the end all be all that you need to pay attention to. Uh, a lot of times the subject line will kind of trigger that open, um, but more often than not, it's really that sender reputation. It's that relationship you've built with your subscribers over a very long time that determines whether or not they're going to open up your email campaign. Um, so we do see a lot of marketers that will focus in on that open rate metric as a really key indicator of the success of their email campaigns. Um, but I, I would, at least in my opinion, you know, I, uh, say that it's it's not as big of an indicator that you should be paying attention to um it's good to kind of track the overall health of your of your campaigns and identify like richard mentioned identify anomalies uh, in your email program but there's far more important things that you should probably pay attention to um and really one of the big things is just that overall brand impression that relationship that you built with subscribers because that's going to affect open rates more than any single subject line will likely do um by Karina and Richard, I'm sure you guys both have opinions on this as well. Just to piggyback a little bit on this, is the same way that we we recommend don't look at your data in silos. If you're gathering information from or intelligence from all these different vendors, don't look at your metrics in silo. It, it, you need to look at open rate in junction with click through rate, in junction with click rates. In our case, we look at what is the read time? How does that correlate with the clicks? Are our subscribers spending 20 seconds on the message but they're not really clicking or maybe they're just spending two seconds and then clicking right away it's important to look at all these metrics together and not necessarily get honed in on just one specific one um richard i'm not sure what your thoughts are on this one no i completely agree it's the combination of the overall health and overall engagement with with the brand you know there's some clients where you know we're we're passing in information via email and there's not a lot of click action to be taken and so especially with you know the changes in the space you know gmail has the you know thumbnails now in their preview on the on the app you know so there's a lot more information that people are digesting that doesn't necessarily warrant uh, an open event if you will um so i think all aspects and all engagement metrics combined really paint a better picture than any one particular metric um, to hone in on Awesome. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Richard, I think this one is a great one for you. Um, John was wondering, you know, when, when we're looking at subscriber email clients, what's the minimum threshold of percentage of users that you use for spending time on making sure an email that you're building works on that device or client? Um, so that's a great question. A lot of that has to do with with the brand, you know, so we, we do work with a lot of variety of different brands. Some are very focused on brand aesthetic and some are more, you know, kind of transactional in nature. And so I think it really warrants an internal discussion on how do you want to portray yourself in the space and that that should dictate how much time you actually spend, you know, remediating error or, you know, rendering issues and focusing on, on kind of production. Um, you know, email is, is one aspect of an overall marketing objective and plan. And so I think it, it really is determined based on the brand and the brand goals themselves to dictate how much effort you'd put into any one channel and then kind of remediation in any one issue. Perfect. Let's see. <laughs> so many questions, you guys. Thank you guys so much for all of these excellent questions. Um, let's see. Uh, Philip was wondering, as someone wanting to implement more of these metrics, what can be a good strategy to utilize them when limited resources are available, like a limited headcount? Sorry, is that that we're wants to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're also all muted um, to some degree, so apologies <laughs> for the delay. But um, getting started is pick one thing that you want to understand. I'd say like 
pick a lane. If you want to understand what um, maybe subject line resonates more with your audience, then focus on that open rate metric. Focus on your delivery, focus on the open rate, and understand how the construction of your subject line goes through to that. If you rather focus on how can I bring more visits through email, then focus perhaps on your the elements that impact your click rate. Um, if you want to uh, maybe decrease the number of customer support calls you receive, um, review the content that you're providing in your in your um, emails. So it, it, there's so much data and there's so many things that like a wild goose chase that we can kind of go after. It can be very challenging, but pick one thing that you want to test or that you want to review or that you want to focus on to then start paving your way that way. Um, what I found when I when I worked um, again in the email service provider side, I was working with a retailer where she, we were really trying to understand um, how much promotion affected email purchase in general. So we actually started implementing very small tests, and in order to uh, gather the data, we we looked at very specific metrics, which was the click rate and the conversion. They were able to attribute um, sales to their emails. Um, and we only actually focus on one campaign. Well, we can, we definitely kept an eye on everything else. We focus on our reporting efforts on one particular uh, campaign uh, to understand how sale impacted or promotion impacted uh, a second purchase. So we had to focus and, and channel our efforts into one particular campaign to make the case and justify that what we that was the case, either worked or didn't work. And then from there, we were able to create a strategy based on those results to create a strategy in terms of how to roll it out to a larger group. And it actually, based on the resorts and even the collaboration we, we had between the client and myself as her account manager, we were able to say, hey, it's actually worth for you to spend X amount of dollars working with a strategy team um, to help you um, to help you design this or to help you drive the um, the review or the the annotation of data even further um, or sometimes it's just um, again spending a little bit of time and asking the right questions and figuring out how can you make the case internally so that you're able to free up yourself more um, to dive into the analytics Richard or Jason any thoughts from you guys so I completely agree. I think it's important to, to pick a tactic or strategy and, and focus your efforts there, as you mentioned, but also get internal alignment. You know, if you've got cross teams kind of working on a single objective, the likelihood of getting support there is, is much higher. And so, you know, focus on one thing, kind of build connections or, or kind of partnerships with peers and, and get alignment on what, what the objective is. And if it kind of meets multiple goals for the for the group and, and attack it that way. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add, to add to that discussion. I think you guys both uh, hit it right on the head there. And I know we're at the top of the hour here. <laughs> so I wanna wrap up for anybody that has other work to do if they wanna start digging into their own email analytics, uh, taking some of the inspiration from this webinar and putting it to work in their own email programs. Uh, I guess now's the time to do it. Uh, so I did wanna say thank you. Uh, there's a couple of links up here that you can learn more about email analytics. Uh, the Litmus products specifically, just go to litmus.com slash email dash analytics, and that will give you a great overview of the Litmus email analytics platform on how you can start taking those insights and putting them to work. Uh, make sure you check out litmus.com slash blog. That's the Litmus blog that will post the follow-up blog post uh, for this webinar, along with the answers to a lot of those questions, additional resources, videos, stuff like that. Um, and then Ansira.com is the main way to get a hold of Ansira, uh, Richard and his team and all the great work they're doing. Um, yeah, so thank you again for to Karina and Richard for joining us. Uh, this was a fantastic discussion. I, I love hearing all these uh, great tips for using email analytics and really putting them to work and understanding them better so that we can all start sending subscribers better email campaigns. Um, so be sure to subscribe to Litmus newsletters, litmus.com slash subscribe uh, to stay up to date on future webinars. We host these pretty regularly um, on all kinds of topics and we will see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye.